Hello and welcome to Electronics with Emrys. In this video, we're going to be talking about spice. Spice mining. No, not that spice. Spice. No, not that one either. Not that much. And when you season a burger, that you want to be my lover. Uh, definitely not them. No, we're talking about the simulation program with integrated circuit emphasis. Yes, that's an acronym if you didn't know. Whenever we talk about solving a circuit, specifically what we're saying is whenever we put together a whole bunch of circuit components of known values with a known source, what are the voltages and currents that will appear in that circuit whenever we turn it on? And that's what our simulator is doing for us. So what I'm showing on this page from the University of Central Florida are two different methods that are used to solve circuits. These are not the only two ways to solve circuits. In fact, probably if you go to a basic electronics course, you learned a simpler method, and that would be to write down the different Kirchhoff's equations and to write down the relationships between the different components with voltage and current. So, you know, Ohm's law or uh, for uh, capacitors and inductors, they have IV relationships also that you can write down. But once you put all these equations down, then you can massage them with algebra and end up with a good solution. But these two are the more systematic methods that are used, and these result in matrix equations that you can use to directly solve using linear algebra techniques. So on the top, we have the mesh analysis method. My professor called this MAME, the mesh analysis matrix equation method of solving circuits. And then the bottom one is the nodal analysis method, or name, as he would say, nodal analysis matrix equation method for solving circuits. And these are different primarily in that in the top one, you're going to be solving and getting currents. In the end, you have four different currents that you're going to be solving for here. And whenever you spit this out the other end of your matrix equations, you're going to get solutions of what those currents are. And then you're going to have to go back and plug in those currents to get the voltages across these resistors. In the other method, you're going to be having variables that are voltages. So you're going to have unique voltage nodes in this circuit that we're worried about. And you can see them labeled as V1, V2, V3. And the fourth one is not as obvious, but that's the bottom here, and that's our reference. So that's going to be the ground node, which they did not label in this example. Whenever we run our equations through linear algebra and we come out the other end, we're now going to directly have voltages. So we're going to know the voltage across this R3 immediately, instead of in this case up here, where we're going to have to take the difference between I1 and I2, and then use Ohm's law to determine the voltage across it. But in this case down here, we do not have the current directly, but we can easily get it by taking Ohm's law and the voltage across this resistor. We can get that current through it. So whenever you look at a SPICE simulator, it's using this second method. And in fact, it's not exactly this method. I understand it's a modified nodal analysis technique. So let's pull up the Wikipedia page on that. I'm certainly not going to go into all the details here, and I'm not going to pretend like I know exactly how every SPICE simulator works, but it's my understanding that they all use the modified nodal analysis technique ever since, I believe, SPICE 3, the third version of the original SPICE, and that's what everyone's been using for a long time. I'm sure there's someone out there that can correct me and give more details in the comments, but that's not the point of this video. This modified nodal analysis does a full nodal analysis where we get the voltages out the other end, but it also includes some currents for cases where the current matters more. And I do not know the exact method that that's going to be implemented, but really the, the main reason I bring any of this up is that whenever you are running a simulation in a SPICE simulator, it handles voltages much better than it handles currents. In my experience, voltages are treated very directly and currents are a little bit more nebulous, even though it does give you a direct answer when you put, I don't want to imply that it's not accurate whenever it comes to the currents that it's generating, but I've found that if I put in a voltage of a specific number and whenever I come out the other end of my solution, that voltage has remained consistent. Uh, but if I put in currents, there's a chance that it will be off by a small amount on the other end. 
and you'll get a little bit of error because the simulator had to convert that into a voltage for the nodal analysis and then it comes back to current. So point being, when you're making SPICE models, if you want to utilize a value as a variable, something that you're going to reference and use in the rest of your SPICE model, which we will get into later, then we're going to be using voltages and not currents for that, and this is the reason why. So LT SPICE, or Linear Technologies SPICE Simulator, is the first simulator that's on my list of four that I want to show today. I'm going to guess that the majority of you have seen LT Spice before, and you've probably even used LT Spice before, because this is such a prolific simulator. It seems like everyone that I talk to uses this and has used this. There's really only one reason I can think of that you would not be using LT Spice, and that's if you work for a competitor to linear technologies, because somebody over there decided they didn't want their competitors using this software to develop their circuits. So instead of being an industry standard across the entire industry, this is an industry standard for people who are not developing semiconductor devices. This is QSPICE, developed for Corvo by the same individual that was primarily responsible for LT Spice, Mike Engelhart. And this is my favorite new simulator. Um, you, I'm sure if you have seen anything from my channel, you have seen multiple times of me using QSpice. It's become my go-to simulator for just picking up and using for general use cases. And I understand that it works essentially the same as LT Spice. This does have the one benefit that it was developed specifically in mind with everyone being allowed to use it, which is one of the reasons I really like it. But it makes a really, it's going to make another good test point for us for our general SPICE discussion. This is Tina, which is another simulator. And you can see from the screen here that I'm running version 9, and it is dash TI. So this is known as Tina TI. And it is quite a few versions behind the current version of Tina. I understand the latest version of Tina is much more stable and works much better than this one. Unfortunately, the new one is not free. You can go and get Tina for free from TI's website, uh, but only the version nine that I'm looking at right now, and that's the one I'm going to be using to show my examples because that's what you are going to be able to get for free. And uh, realistically, there are other options available. I'm not sure why anyone would run this one specifically, but it is another simulator that we can use and we can see a few quirks uh, from this simulator compared to others. Finally, this is NG Spice, and you'll note immediately that NG Spice does not have a real graphical interface. This interface is really just a terminal where you can enter commands into it. If you've ever used KiCad to generate a simulation result, then you would be using NG Spice in the back end, and it's going to be linked into the front end of that. But I'm going to be using the generic ng spice directly because I'm going to be entering spice files straight into this and we will get results. One of the reasons I like ng spice is that it's completely open source. It includes the original Berkeley spice, so I believe version 3 is what they developed this from, and it has a couple of other simulators built in. Uh, one is called Cider, which I have not used at all, so I'm not going to go into any details on that. The other is XSpice, which allows you to run a lot of digital circuits very quickly and allows you to integrate your digital circuitry into Spice relatively easily. The one huge downside of NGSpice, of course, is that there's no graphical interface, but for our discussion on Spice and the Spice language, I think NG Spice is a great example and their documentation is fantastic. So you can go in and learn a lot and find out pretty much anything you need to know and utilize this simulator for a lot of capabilities that others may be more difficult to use. Now you might be wondering why I'm not including Cadence. Um, Cadence is one of the biggest developers of Spice simulation on the market but primarily because I don't have any access to Cadence. I don't have any free simulators for it. The closest thing I have is PSPICE 4 TI, which is very limiting. I'm not able to put in direct SPICE code into that to get out results. So we're not going to be talking about this. 
if you're going to university to be a chip designer or a circuit designer, you're probably going to run into Cadence products. They have very good simulators. Um, on top of the regular Cadence P-Spice, there's also H-Spice, which I'm not sure who that was developed by, but whenever I was in college, I was using Cadence, the, the Linux version of Cadence, to do all of my circuit development and then layout of ICs. Once you've developed your circuit in Cadence, then you could export that and then run your simulation in H-Spice. Now, I know at my work, uh, we use Spectre as the simulator, which I'm not 100% sure if that is correct, that Spectre is the simulator. Uh, that may only be the front end and HSpice might still be the back end. But regardless, uh, there are a bunch of professional level simulators out there that I'm not going to be talking about. And my point here is that we're only going to be looking at the four free ones that are freely available. And we're going to look at uh, some of the capabilities of those and how you can understand these. Let's do some actual simulations and look at how you can see the netlist and capabilities of these different simulators a bit. So here we have our four simulators with LT Spice in the top left, Q Spice in the top right, Tina in the bottom left, and finally NG Spice in the bottom right. I'm going to start by running a Hello World type of simulation. I'm going to be putting the same simulation into all four of these. Specifically, we're going to simulate this circuit, which is a voltage source and two resistors set up as a voltage divider. I'm going to be doing a transient simulation, and the remainder of this is just used by ng-spice to run the simulation and then plot the results. I'm just going to copy this first part. And then in LT Spice, I'll open a new schematic. Paste in my code, hit OK. And then I just need to click anywhere to place this. We've put absolutely nothing else into LT Spice. I'm going to right click and hit run. You don't have a circuit here to probe directly, but you can right click in the plot window and then select add traces and then add in your two voltages that you want to view. And we can see that we have two and a half and five volts as we would expect. Moving on to QSpice, we're going to press T to enter some text, paste in our, our code, click somewhere to place it, and then again, right click, run simulation. And similarly, we have to right click in this plot area and add a plot. And then we're going to add these two voltages. And we can see we have 5 volts and 2.5 volts, just like we'd expect. Heading over to Tina, it gets a little bit more complicated. I'm not going to show how to enter a SPICE file directly into a schematic just yet. We're going to use the tool called the Netlist Editor. Here we can paste in our netlist and then do an analysis on that netlist. Now, if we do the transient analysis, I've found that it won't display anything and I don't know a way to force it to display anything. So instead, I'm just going to do a DC analysis and calculate the node voltages. Here we can see node one is five volts, node two is two and a half volts, and our supply is generating two and a half milliamps. That's exactly what we'd expect. And last but not least, ng-spice, we're going to be running this file. It's called helloworld.cir. So in order to do that, we type in source helloworld.cir, press enter. And you can see that the initial transient solution provides us with the node voltages already. We have node one is five volts, node two is two and a half volts, and the current in the branch is two and a half milliamps. And we also see a plot come up on my other monitor that shows two and a half volts for voltage at two and five volts. So this is exactly what we expect again. So all four of these are able to run this simple simulation, no problem. The biggest difference is that in NG Spice, we have to put in a few extra commands. We have to tell it to save all of the waveforms. Then we have to tell it to run the simulation and plot the simulation results. My normal method for creating SPICE code is to create it as a subcircuit. 
So let's look at the syntax for creating a subcircuit now. Just open a generic text document. I've installed the Spice language as a markup so that I can see what I'm doing a little easier. Remember to always start your Spice files with a comment. The directive for a subcircuit is .subckt. Then you can follow that with any valid name. And then you list all the ports for the subcircuit. In my case, I've added five ports, including one for ground. I personally like to include a ground pin on my subcircuit so that I'm able to create a direct relation to the ground of the simulator. I've run into some problems in the past if I use the zero node inside a subcircuit, not necessarily having that link correctly to the zero node for the rest of the circuit. I've used a couple of basic components to create some buffers. The first component I used is an E source, which is a voltage controlled voltage source. The positive side of this is connected to an internal node called int A, and the negative side is connected to a ground, which is one of our ports. The control node for this, since it's a voltage controlled voltage source, that voltage is going to be from in A on the positive side to A ground on the negative side. And the gain of my voltage controlled voltage source is one. So I'm directly copying the voltage at in A to A ground over to int A, A ground. And I'm doing the exact same thing with in B, copying it to internal B. Next, I add a resistor called R1 from that internal node to an internal node called int A underscore delay. The value is one kilo ohm. And finally, I create a capacitor from int A delay to A ground of one nanofarad. I drew up that same circuit over in QSpice so you can see the exact layout if you have a hard time visualizing it from just the text. There is one piece that I left out of this visualization, which is going to be another voltage controlled voltage source because this one is using a value equals statement instead of a set of control pins. And that's not something that QSpice supports directly. I can show you later, but uh, QSpice requires using a B source instead of an E source if you want to use this uh, value equals equation method. This voltage controlled voltage source is outputting from out A to A ground. And the value of that is a little difficult to read the way this is. So just for a moment, I moved the text out of this value so it's a little easier to read on this video. Uh, the value is going to be an if statement. And the if statement is if the voltage at INTA underscore delay is greater than 0.5, then we're going to have a one value and otherwise we will have a zero value. Now, something really important to bring up here is that whenever you're measuring a voltage like this using V parentheses, you're always taking a voltage between two points, just like any voltage in any circuit. But if you don't include a second value, so if you don't put comma a ground, then this is going to assume that we're talking about from int a underscore delay to zero. I'm going to leave it just like this because I'm going to be connecting a ground to node zero, so there won't be any problem there. And put that text back inside of the curly braces. The second buffer is basically the same thing, but the resistor is 10 times larger, so we should get 10 times the delay. And finally, to finish a subcircuit, we put dot end s. That's a directive to let the compiler know that we are ending our subcircuit. And to make this more human readable, usually you'll put a space and then the name of your subcircuit. That's not required at all for the compiler, but it is something that is very helpful whenever you're reading code to be able to tell which function ends where. Now I've saved the file as subcircuit.lib. LIB is the traditional extension used for files that contain one or more subcircuits for Spice. You don't necessarily have to use a .lib file, but some simulators will give you a hard time if you don't. Usually .cir is the extension that's used for a general spice file. You'll also see .mod files, which are model files, 
and they typically just contain a dot model statement to allow users to create something, for example, like a uh, transistor. So now I've saved this off and I'm going to be putting it into each of the different simulators. I'll show you how to do that. In LTSpice, I've found the easiest way to create a symbol for a subcircuit is to go to File and then Open, change down here the type of file to All Files, and then you go find the folder where your file is. I've already gone there. That's subcircuit.lib. Open it. And now this is just a text editor. It doesn't do anything special inside of LTSpice. But what you can do is click on the subcircuit statement here, right click, and choose create symbol. LTSpice will ask if you want to automatically create a symbol for this, and I would recommend saying yes. I've already done this before, so I'm going to go ahead and overwrite the one I have. And now I have that subcircuit. You don't need to do anything with this. You can just immediately close it. I'm going to close out that library also. In order to add that component, I'm going to use the component button at the top, then go to auto generated. And this is a list of a bunch of different components that I've used in LT Spice over time. My subcircuit is the one we want to use. Hit OK. And now we have a symbol for our subcircuit. You, of course, can copy it as many times as you want, but I just want one of these. Now I'm going to put together a quick test circuit for this. I like to use a PWL for a step function because it's the easiest to me. At time zero, I'm going to have a value of zero, and at one nanosecond, I'm going to have a value of one. Now I can right click and hit run. I'm going to run the simulation up to 10 microseconds. And now I can observe my input, which is just going to be a step function that starts at the very, very beginning here. We, we see that it's a very fast edge. And then the outputs are going to happen at later times. The first edge is right about 700 nanoseconds. And the second edge happens at right about 7 microseconds. Now I can show one of my absolute favorite features of QSpice. I'm going to take the code from my subcircuit file here and I'm just going to copy it with control C. Then in QSpice, I'm going to hover over my schematic and hit control V. The program asked me if I want to auto generate a symbol. I'll say yes. And now I have that symbol to mess around with. I'm going to go ahead and move my output over to the right side here and adjust that just to look a little cleaner. The rest of the circuit is exactly the same as LT Spice. Right click and hit Run Simulation. We can see our inputs very fast, then the outputs happen at approximately the same times that LT Spice showed. We can look at the exact values here. Around 700 nanoseconds for the first output and around 7 microseconds for the second output. Tina is fairly similar to LT Spice. We're going to go to Tools and go to New Macro Wizard. I just give it a name, open the file. One minor difference with Tina is if you open a library with multiple subcircuits, at this point it will ask you which subcircuit you want to use. It would give you a drop down menu for all the different ones in the file. So in this case, there's only one subcircuit, so it chose for me. I'm going to go ahead and auto generate the shape just like with the others. Save that as a macro. And just like before, I've already done this, so I have to overwrite it. Hit insert, and now I have that subcircuit to play around with. One big difference with Tina is that you have to actually connect all of the pins. If you don't, you'll get errors. The simulator will still run with disconnected ports, but it's annoying that it pops up with those errors every time. 
You can see there's an artifact here from me dragging this around. I found that Tina tends to have problems with artifacting like this. If you press F5, it'll redraw everything and get rid of any of those. Now I'm going to run a transient analysis just like before for 10 microseconds. Hit OK. It looks like the simulator in Tina gave us a little bit later time than what we got in the other simulators. They had about 700 nanoseconds and this one has about 750 nanoseconds. The second output looks very close at 6.95 microseconds, which is pretty much what we had on the others. I was just calling it 7 microseconds. Just for comparison's sake, I'm going to zoom in. We can see that edge is almost exactly 100 nanoseconds long. In LT Spice, we see that it's more like 10 nanoseconds. So why is one simulator showing 10 nanoseconds and the other is showing 100 nanoseconds? Well, this is primarily related to the way that the simulator optimizes things. So the simulator is going to do its best to give you accurate results, but it's also going to try to reduce the amount of time it takes to run this simulation. It looks like in the case of Tina, it's taking time steps that are 10 times as long as those in LT Spice. In QSpice, we can observe the same thing and see that the waveform is approximately 10 nanoseconds here. Now, there is a way to force this to be faster if you want to have those edges be more crisp. Because if you remember how my subcircuit is written, I used an if statement. So this if statement says, if the value is above 0.5, then output a 1. And if it's below 0.5 or equal to 0.5, it'll be a 0. That's an instantaneous change for the simulator. So whenever it does a calculation, it's going to say this voltage node is either going to be 0.5 or less or greater than 0.5. There is no other option. So these are not real points in between. You can actually see that the data is only at the top and at the bottom. In between, there are no data points. This is not actually a ramp, but an instantaneous change that was linearized by the simulator. In order to get my subcircuit into NG Spice, I have to actually write a Spice file to do this. So I'm just going to modify my Hello World script to call the subcircuit. And you can see all I've done is call the subcircuit using an X component. So that X means subcircuit. I named it X1 and the five ports are A, B, Y, Z, and zero. The last thing we have to do for our NG Spice file is we're going to have to add in a voltage source. And that voltage source is going to be a pulse source. This voltage source is connected from A to zero, and that pulse is going to be going from a starting voltage of zero to a final voltage of one. That's going to have no delay. The rising edge is one nanosecond, falling edge is one nanosecond. The pulse width is one, and the period is two with 10 repetitions. These don't really matter all that much because I'm only running a few microseconds here. There is one more thing we have to change in here, and that's in our sub-circuit call. We have A and B, but then our voltage source is only A. In our GUI, we were able to tie these two together by just shorting them in the circuit. But here, I've named them separately. So how could I connect these together? Well, there's a few different ways you can do it. One way would be to use a resistor. You have a resistor that connects from A to B, one ohm. You cannot input zero ohms in most simulators, but you can do it one ohm or one milli ohm to have something that's just a short between those two. You could also have a voltage source, so V1, and have that be zero volts. And that is a dead short, so that would be the equivalent of putting a zero ohm resistor from A to B. Of course, we would have to name it something else because we can't have the same name as our other source. 
but the easiest approach is to not include another component and then just name that second pin the same thing. So A is connected to B because they are both named A. The name here is unrelated to the name here. Now that we've created our ng-spice script file, let's go ahead and save it and try to run it. Now we get our first error here, and this error is expected, but it's because the ng-spice syntax is a little different from all of the other simulators that we've been using. So in ng-spice, there is no if statement. So inside of our subcircuit, we have this if v of int a delay is greater than 0.5. That's not something you can do in ng-spice directly. But there is a way around this. So first, let's go take a look in the documentation so you can see what it says. I just searched for ternary, so we can see the ternary operator is going to have c question mark x colon y, which is a fairly standard way to write the if statement in shorthand. So you have your logical statement, question mark, and then the value of true and the value of false. But if we want to turn this into an actual if statement so we don't have to change our subcircuit, what we can do is define our own function. The dot func directive lets you do this. And you can see they have two different ways to write it out. You have dot func identifier and then expression, or you can do identifier equals expression. They're equivalent. So basically I defined three variables called x, y, and z. And the first one is our logical statement. Second one is the value of true. Third one is value of false. We're going to save this and then attempt to run again. And now you can see that we got pretty much the same results that we expect from the others. The edges are going to be much faster here because I specifically asked for a transient time here of one nanosecond steps. So that's going to give you a one nanosecond edge, unlike the others, which had 10 and 100 nanoseconds respectively. And we can see one other big difference in ng-spice here is that this is just an image. There's not a way for me to trace these exactly. You can zoom in by using your right mouse button, dragging a small window there. And when you let go, it will draw a new window. And you can keep doing this to get closer and closer so you can get an idea of the time scale of an edge like this. So there you can see that we're going from 692.8 up to 694 nanoseconds. So basically 693 to 694 nanoseconds. So one nanosecond edge, exactly what we expect because that's our time step. At this time step, the value was calculated to be zero. And at this time step, the value was calculated to be one. Very simple. If you've made it this far in the video, I wanna say thank you very much for watching. I wanted to keep this video under 30 minutes total and it's starting to get a little too long. So I've decided to go ahead and cut this topic off right here. And I'm gonna continue on in the next video. I plan to pick up next time with making a NOR gate subcircuit and creating a latch with that. Again, thank you very much for watching and I hope you have a great day.